it's really important to me that our children have a very healthy relationship with money and remember that kids model what we do. So if you don't have a great relationship with money, your kids will not either. You need to have an empowered, strong relationship with money so that your children can. Alexa Von Tobel, who's the CEO and founder of LearnVest. She's currently the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, which invests in early stage startups. CEO of LearnVest.com, one of the fastest growing financial planning companies here in the United States. She's a certified financial planner. She wrote the New York Times best-selling book, Financially Fearless and Financially Forward. Is there anything you're doing behind the scenes as a parent, like a 529 plan or a custodial Roth IRA to set your kids up financially? All of it. I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. What do you think made you succeed as an entrepreneur? Not many people can say that they sold a company for $375 million. First of all, so happy to be here. When I think back to the skill set that is critical to be an entrepreneur, I think two really big things matter. Um, the first, which is probably pretty obvious, is grit and resilience. And I think I grew up with two older brothers my whole life. I feel like I was always I had a sprint to keep up. And personally, I've been through a, a, a lot in my own life. Lost my dad when I was younger. And I think that that resilience muscle is a really, really important one. And uh, I once had somebody that I work with say to me, what's it like to work with Alexa? And I looked at her and I was like, what do you say? I was like, I'm dying to hear. And she goes, you get punched in the face every day and you just like move through it. And being an entrepreneur, you're constantly having things. Somebody says no, something doesn't work. Some, somebody quits, something's going sideways every day. And I think just like an incredible resilience is really important. The second thing is I'm a really positive person. Um, I'm like deeply optimistic, probably even idealistic at times and just bring kind of a can-do attitude to everything. And I don't know wh where that came from or wh you know why I'm wired that way, but very much a get up, dress up, show up is like a theme of mine, which is get up early, uh, get dressed um, and show up with a great attitude. And I think that that is a motto that served me really well. And I think when, again, you're getting punched in the face every day as an entrepreneur, having an attitude that just says, listen, we're going to figure it out. We're going to get through this. We're going to come up with the right answer. And you really need that in order to just inspire people to continue to move behind you. And was LearnVest your first company that you started as an entrepreneur? No. Uh, so when I was younger, uh, I started a little company so that I could buy leotards. I was a gymnast and I, my like mom, uh, you know, I like had to, had to like work and save. And um, my mom was like, you can't buy everything you want. Um, and so I came up with a little company so that I could buy leotards. And then when I was in high school, I created like a little tutoring company, tutor neighbors and um, make some extra money. And then... When I went to Harvard, I started a few things while I was there. And then after school, helped a friend who had founded a company, two friends who had founded a company, um, build that company. That company got bought by Facebook, then learned us. So uh, I, would, I don't know if it was my fourth or fifth company, how I would think about it, but it was my first really big swing. It was like the first time, in, you know, I, I think I've inspired my new company. So in, in so many ways, um, Learn Best was really my first big company. And what made you feel like that could be the one? Where was the need that you saw in the marketplace at the time? Yeah, what was interesting about LearnVest was it was so organic. I hadn't set out to say, I'm going to go start this business. Or, you know, sometimes entrepreneurs sit in front of me and say, I really want to start a company. And I very much, uh, you know, have moments where I wasn't looking to be a CEO. I was trying to solve a problem. And the problem was, came from my own life. Uh, I was sitting there. I was a at Morgan Stanley, I was, whatever, 22 years old for the first time making real money, real savings. And I just remember being like, I can't believe that there's nobody in the world who wants to manage my money because I'm young. And I just had this sort of this circular question that went through my head, which was like, when you're young, nobody wants to help you with your money because you don't have any money, but you need somebody to help you with your money so you don't make mistakes so you can have more money. And just being like, this is such a circular argument and this is insane. and literally the light bulb went off and I was like, learn best, learn, earn, invest. You need to learn about it. You need to earn it and you need to invest it. And it should be focused on young people. It should be all digital and completely trustworthy, transparent. Uh, you know, you, you, you're not confused about how you're getting charged open 24 hours a day. And like that's back when banks were only open, you know, nine to five and closed on the weekends and all these other silly things. And that was it. 
And like light bulbs went off. It was in my head. Started writing a business plan. And my boyfriend's dad at the time helped me literally stand up the company. My mom was the president legally on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, I was 23 years old and it was May of 2007. Ooh. So then what happens? Well, so I literally started working on it nights and weekends. And then in the fall of 2008, I went to, I had to go to Harvard, I went to Harvard Business School. Um, I'd gotten into college or gotten into business school when I was a senior in college and I had deferred and they said, you have to come. You can't keep deferring. And I showed up, got through that semester and that's when Lehman Brothers went under. And I remember at this point, I'd been working on the idea for almost a year and a half, kind of nights and weekends. And I, I had this very clear moment. I was like, when the world zigs, you have to zag. And this is the moment when the world is in true financial crisis this is the best time on the planet to go launch something as scary as it was for me to go do it at that moment. It was the exact perfect moment to go do it. And I've read that, that a lot of great companies that we look at now were started during the recession, right? Yeah. And so really big moments of crisis is when you find a few things happen. First of all, really great founders come out of the woodwork then because they're building for the right reasons. They're not building because they want to be a CEO or there's a problem and it's a very scary time to go build something. So you tend to have the very, very committed founders come out then. Second, uh, when things are scary and, you know, scarcity is real, uh, you know, the great quote, which is like, necessity is the mother of invention. In moments of economic crisis or recessions, you find that people don't have as many options, right? Money isn't everywhere and employees aren't everywhere. And so you end up having a founder. I, I like to use the treadmill example. Founders have to get on the treadmill running, you know, 10 miles per hour because in order to survive, you've got to be going faster because everything is scarcer. So it actually creates a really valuable DNA for the business too um, because everything's harder. So you kind of start in this mode of survival which then carries a DNA throughout the company as well. When you are born during times of plenty, it's easy to run at four miles per hour. Whereas in a recession, you have to run at 10 miles per hour. And so it just carries a culture and a DNA forward of scarcity. And I, you know, I started LearnVest out of my own wallet. Literally, the first money in the company was my own savings. And so every time I had to write a check or pay a bill, I cared deeply that the bill was right and that everything that I was paying for was, was accurate. And that stayed with me all the way through selling it for $375 million. I cared about every penny. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew they ha had to care about every penny. It was just a very, a, a different mindset. And I've heard you say somewhere before that even if you can raise $5 million, don't do that when you only need one. And you really have to like carry that mentality of scarcity throughout to be successful. Constraints are actually very good things. Um, having Scarcity, having constraints is actually a very good thing for decision making because as a CEO, it forces you to say, are we going left or right? Are we going with choice A or B? Whereas in times of plenty, you may say, let's do A and B. And sometimes that means people aren't as good at executing what they're supposed to execute. And so scarcity focus, we call it maniacal focus, really, really detailed focus is a gift. And so if you need one million, don't raise five raise one. And I think it's really important because it forces you only to hire exactly who you need, forces you to make sure those people do precisely what they need to, forces you to make the best decisions. And so again, constraint, scarcity um, is actually a very important thing for a company. I imagine there are some decisions that you made throughout the company that if you look and if you hadn't had that scarce mindset, you might have made the wrong decision that could have led the company astray. Can you point to specific ones that you made? I'll give you an example. In the early days, LearnVest was basically, um, a, I think, TurboTax for financial planning. So we gave subscription financial planning advice where we could take anyone in America, connect you to a financial advisor and give you a plan. And we sold no product. So you always had real trust that you're getting the best advice. But I, we started with content to build our brand. And I was starting it out of my savings. So I had to become a financial expert. And I wrote the content. So I was like, I've got to make sure this content's right. And we didn't have budget to pay anybody else. So I ended up becoming a certified financial planner. I ended up writing New York Times, two books, New York Times bestselling book called Financially Fearless and Financially Forward. 
um, about the future of your wallet. So out of extreme necessity, I became an extreme financial expert. And that's a good example of that was a really big gift for the company because I knew what kind of advisors I wanted to hire for our team. Certified financial planners is what I am a CFP. It's like a doctor of money. And at one point I said, we're going to have, you know, a hundred or so financial planners. I one, I want them to want to come work here, which means I should become one Mm -hmm. um, so that I know how to hire the best and that they respect me and want to come work with me. Um, And so that kind of gives you a sense of the, the mindset, which is when scarcity is real, you end up making sure you know your choices. And that was a good example when I had to start writing the content. And then I said, well, I, I can't write the content if I'm not an expert. Then I'd become an expert. And in the end, that paid, it, it made a lot of the DNA of the company extremely authentic. Something you said there is interesting that I want to dive into a little. You said that your financial planners that you worked with did not sell products. Can you explain what that means and then why that matters? Because right now, a lot of financial advisors, they are compensated on their advice. And I always said financial planning shouldn't be a luxury product. It shouldn't be. Most financial advisors in the country charge somewhere between 1% and 2% of your assets. So if you have $100,000, they charge you 1000 to $2,000 a year. So first of all, you need a lot of money for people to want to work with you. And I just said this whole thing so upside down, like financial planning shouldn't be a luxury product, just like the medical world, getting a doctor isn't a luxury service. Imagine if doctors only saw healthy people. That's sort of how the financial world was working back in 2007, 2008. And I said, that's insane. And so I said, what if we just charge $500 for advice? That's it for the year, $500. And we'll give you a full financial plan. And every time your life changes, we'll rerun a financial plan and we use software to do it. So again, in the rear of your mirror, it didn't seem like a novel idea. It seemed for me like a very sensible, straightforward idea, which was we should just give a financial plan to every American who wants to get one for a fair, straightforward price. And then they get access to their expert for anything that they need. And that was it. And that's what we did. And we became uh, one of the largest financial planning companies in America. I was cover Forbes around uh, the financial, just the, the, the real change of fintech. And most importantly, it started out of just like a very honest need, which was I wanted to be able to have access to an advisor as a young person. And I kept saying, you know, I'm young and don't have crazy money. And I this is insane that I couldn't get access to an expert. And then when when I was younger, my dad had passed away. My mom overnight had to manage our finances. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to be good at finance because this is such an important topic. And so that was the story behind LearnBass. It was a very authentic one. And so in general, as an investor now, I always look for entrepreneurs who are really, really committed to their mission. What they're building is has to be born. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Where it, it's it, they're being willed or compelled by something that is not about money or success. I want to pull the curtain back, though, still around this financial advisors theme, because I think that a lot of financial advisors do not have their clients' best interests at heart. And what I'm referring to is a lot of them will sell products that they make commission on the back end. And so they're kind of incentivized to to put clients into those life insurance policies or whatever it is where they're going to make extra money on the back end. And I think, if I recall correctly, LearnVest was not doing that, right? Correct. Um, LearnVest was just straightforward advice. And then we would say, go to Schwab, go to Fidelity, go to, you know, wherever you want to, to get what you need. And then there we would be, we'd recommend things like ETFs and index funds, which are effectively close to, you know, negligible, very, very minor fees um, to help people save every dollar. As you became a finance expert and really started to understand the world, what else disturbed you about what the current financial practices were like, what the current industry looked like? First of all, think about it. Uh, you know, I, I often don't like to, you know, always say where I went to school, but I went to a great school. I didn't have one minute of financial education. So I'll just start with, it is insane to me that money, you know, I always said, I don't worship money. I'm very much practical when it comes to money. Um, Money is a tool, but it is a lifeline. It's part of every day of your life, every single day, to put a roof over your head, to have food, to go from one place to the next. You need money to be able to exist. Yet we learn nothing about it. And that just for me was blasphemy. I mean, it's really wild. And so... I'll start there. Financial literacy is just a massive problem for the country. And I would love to say that a decade later or, you know, almost 15 years later that it's better, but it's not. Um, It's still this topic that we're all very stressed about. 
Um, money is filled with shame and emotion, and it really should just be a practical thing. Just like we learn to brush our teeth and take showers and basic hygiene. There should be a basic financial hygiene that we all learn. And it's just wild to me still that it's just not in every school in America. If you could design the curriculum to put into every school in America, what would you put in it? I literally did. It's called Financially Fearless. It's my it's my first book, which was an instant bestseller. I wrote the book truly because I, I said to myself, there should be a textbook that could go in every school, really simple, where you just learn about the basics of money and in a way that doesn't put you to sleep. And that's what Financially Fearless was. And what was in it? What was the blueprint? The blueprint was um, really six big chapters. Um, we kind of invented this at Learn Best, but um, we invented a financial plan. And I'll quickly go through the six chapters just to give you a sense. Chapter one is you have to understand how much money you have, where it is, know your numbers. So we teach you the numbers that matter in money. Chapter two is you need a detailed budget and you need to know what it means to live within your means because everyone knows you're supposed to live within your means. But what are my means? How do I even know how to think about that? The third step, is we call it the monopoly step, which is you have to be able to do three things or else you can't pass go. And those three things are you need emergency savings for a real catastrophe. You need no credit card debt. Most people in America have, you know, literally almost $10,000 of credit card debt. And you need to have a retirement savings account to be able to start investing for retirement. So those are the three things you must have a plan to figure out. After that is step four. That's the fun stuff. That's you want to buy a home, you want to have a baby, you want to buy a new car, you want to renovate your kitchen, you want to go to Tahiti on a trip, you want to go to Bali, wherever. We'll figure it out and we'll put a plan in place so that you can actually make that happen safely. Chapter five is about insurance, which as boring as insurance is, insurance is one of the things that can keep you from going bankrupt because you need health insurance every day. You need auto insurance legally to drive. You need renter's insurance, even if, you know, $5 a month, it if your apartment burns down, everything you own is gone. That's a real crisis. And then finally, chapter six is investing. So if you have money outside of all of that, then we focus on investing outside of your retirement account. So it's really that simple. It's six steps and with a wrapper over it, which is about the hygiene that you need to keep every single year. So and it's financially fearless, you can literally get it anywhere, um, Amazon, et cetera. And we purposely made it really affordable so that everybody could get access to it. Let's dig into the budgeting step because I also feel like that is one of the most fundamental things that people can do for their finances. Instead of, it's very easy to fall in the trap of ignoring it. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist. And I know when I was in two hundred thousand dollars of debt, like that was my approach for a while. Was just I don't want to see it. I don't want to think about it. But budgeting is the one thing that I think makes you see what is actually going on. What's coming into your bank account? What's leaving? And then is there enough left at the end of the month to put it towards your savings, your retirement, your investments, right? So what is your theory when it comes to budgeting? Yeah, it's so funny. Budgets feel like this like constraint, this like terrible word. And in fact, all budgets are is the guardrails to help you just know what your rules are. And so basically, uh, there's this rule I'm going to teach you it quickly. It's called the 50-20-30 rule. And I didn't come up with it. It literally is a financial planning rule. And let's pretend, I'm going to quickly do it to you, Erica. Let's pretend that you make $1,000 a month, okay? 50% or less. So 50% or less of your $1,000 that you make after taxes, so the money that actually hits your bank account, should go to your essentials. That's the roof over your head. That's your electricity bill. That's your grocery bill. And it's your transportation to and from work because that transportation is how you keep your paycheck. 20% or more, so that's $200 of, of your paycheck each, each month, goes to the future. That's savings. So that goes into your 401k. That goes into your emergency savings. Your saving for children goes in your kids, you know, kids savings account. Or if once I, I now have kids, my kids 529 accounts for college. 30% or less is your lifestyle. So 50% or less is your essentials. It's literally how you exist. You could live off that alone. It's again, roof over your head, electricity, groceries, and transportation to and from work. 20% or more is saving for the future. And then 30% or less is your shopping, going out to eat, you know, uh, you know, a friend's birthday party. And that is living within your means. And so that's the boundaries of a budget. I think that one of the reasons why the 50, 20, 30 rule has gotten so much traction is like 
everything in life, sometimes people don't like to be told there are 20 different options for how you can budget. People like to have the blueprint. And I do think the 50, 20, 30 rule gives like a nice blueprint to follow. And it's just a starting point, right? Because you may find that as your income increases, maybe you're going to try to save 30% or 40% of your money and put that towards investments. But I do like it as a starting point. Yeah. I mean, it's simple, right? And I think the best things in life when you're trying to change behavior is just to give people really simple rules. And it's something everybody can follow. And so quickly you realize what it means to live within your means because your means have now been actually perfectly defined for you. Mm -hmm. And it forces you also to actually budget because there's no way you can know what your wants, needs and savings are without actually going through your last month and seeing, okay, where is the money going? And then which category does each one fit into, right? Yeah. And it's again, it just, it makes it, I, I always love bright, clear lines and that's what it is. Any other fun, bright, clear lines that you want to teach our audience? <laughs> you know, I've got to just rip the, the bandaid off of the shame around money because, and so I just want to, I always say to people, every one of us knows people who have more. We all growing up had people who had a lot more and some people that probably had less. And that's the really odd thing about money is that it's very comparative. So just stop comparing. And, and I think the thing here is money is not the goal of life. You know, this is not the dress rehearsal. This is the only life you have. You get to do it once. So stop feeling the shame around money because the second you just feel empowered around your wallet. And I remember the first time I got a financial plan and my husband, um, we were engaged. We were young. Um, I'd been running Learn Best, but we finally did a plan together. I had my own financial plan before that, but we were doing it together. I just remember feeling so empowered. I was like, we have a lot that we need to do to accomplish all the goals but I now know where I'm running. I understand what I'm working towards. And money can feel extremely empowering, but you have to turn the page on the shame. So I always like to tell people, rip the bandaid off. Like this is just, money is not something that you should feel, you should feel terrible about. We, we all have made mistakes. So just start letting yourself feel empowered. What would you say were your biggest money mistakes? I mean, literally dozens. I remember, uh, freaking out because I applied for like an American Express card when I was like 20. My mom, my mom was like, I think you can apply. And I, I was like, mom, I got denied because I don't have a job. <laughs> she, I was like, I'm in college. And she was like, oh, shucks. And I just remember being like, I just so many mistakes, not reading all my bills, sitting and I just have now learned you sit down, you open every bill, just look at them. You'll find mistakes to so make sure you check them. Um, those sort of things. Uh, but no. And then now I really enjoy, I have a plan. We stick to the plan. The plan is the plan. And it feels like money can be solved because you finally have a clear plan. The bill thing is interesting. I recently, a few months ago, went down the rabbit hole of looking into medical bills and all the errors that come with medical bills. And I spent hours and hours speaking to experts. 80% of medical bills have an error on them. And most people don't even look at it. They just see the full price tag, whatever it is, $5,000 without the actual breakdown. Yeah. So again, very important to read your bill because here's the thing. You're never being undercharged, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're being overcharged. And so I always say, open your bills, read them. You'll always find some money throughout That's the true. year. That's true. I know you're a mother of three kids. I'm curious what you are doing for your kids to set them up financially. So I have three little kids. And I think it's really important to me that our children have a very healthy relationship with money. And what I mean by that is that they really appreciate that things cost money in life. Uh, I think in this day and age when Amazon like magically delivers everything to your door and <laughs> I think my kids think like literally presents like fly it, you know, in from magical thin air with like, you know, fairy wings. I really go out of our way to sit down, especially now, um, that my kids are getting a little bit older. We have a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and an almost eight-year-old. And sitting down and, and helping them understand this is what this costs. If they want to go for an ice cream, you know, I'll say this is going to be the treat for the day. And, you know, it's $10 and here's what this costs. And then if they ask for something else, I'll say, listen, we already got a treat for the day. And, you know, even if I, you know, we're fortunate that we can afford to, to buy another present, I'll say, listen, you know, th these things cost money. Let's put it on your, your list for your birthday or let's save and, and work towards things. And so there's a lot of research that shows if you grew up in a household where money was very secretive and 
behind the scenes and you didn't talk about it either because it was a topic of extreme stress or socially, you know, but we've all been told our whole life, don't talk about money. It's not polite. Well, actually, how are you ever going to get good at money or learn about money if you don't talk about money? And so in the research, if money was just matter of fact, it was on the table, it was something that was clearly communicated. That's what I do. So two things, my little girl and I started a little company together. It's called Cecilia's um, uh, and it's a bracelet company. She sells them for five dollars. And we make them together and it's an absolute blast. But I made her sit down with a little book and we bought the inventory and the inventory cost $10 to get all these be- all these beads. And I literally made her put together a budget and now it becomes real, right? And at one point she was like, are we charging enough? And I was like, that's <laughs> the whole, que- that's exactly the question. That's right. And so one, making it very real, making it very practical. Put, putting money on the table, making it a topic that we talk about, that we work through, and very much saying no and letting them start to earn money. So now, uh, my five-year-old yesterday earned a dollar um, because you know I was juggling three kids, and I said, "If you can go and get, you know, Rosie's clothes uh, and help mommy out today, that'll be a chore, and I'll give you a dollar." And he got so excited, and I was like, "Oh wow, this is <laughs> he's ready. He's ready to start having a job now." Um, and little jars and you make it very visual and let them see it. And it should be physical money because then it becomes very real. And so punchline is money should be talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, even when it's stressful, you know, if, if something is expensive, I'll say, listen, that's really expensive. And mommy and daddy can't afford that. We're not going to, we're not going to buy that. And that's okay. They need to understand. No, they need to hear that. And then the last big aha moment that I had I grew up in a household. My mom is still a nurse. She loves taking care of people. And I won't tell you how old she is because she'd kill me. Uh, But she's in her 70s and she still works uh, every day uh, with my brother who's a doctor. And I have this new orientation because of my mom around work, which is work is not, you know, you walk out the door and little kids don't want you to leave. And even if I came here today, my kids were like, but it's, you know, I want to be with you, mommy. It's the weekend. And I said, Mommy loves what she does. Mommy works really hard and work is something I deeply enjoy because I go, you know how you like puzzles? Mommy does puzzles all day long and she's good at them and I love them. And I think work saying, oh, I have to go to work. Oh, work is awful. You're just creating this relationship in their heads that work sucks and that work is painful when, of course, there's moments where all of our jobs are hard or we're tired and we don't want to go. But the truth is, I love my job and I watch my mom love her job. And my mom still works every day, even though she easily could have retired. She loves her job. She loves being good at her job. And I love being good at my job. And so I think also rewiring how they think about earning money to being a match of their skill sets and what they love. And I think, you know, not every job in the world is fun, but I think work gives us purpose and meaning and you're in community with other people that are working alongside you. And that feels when oriented properly feels really good. That's so interesting. So really being quite strategic about what you are talking about and you encourage people to talk about money with their kids, be very open. But then maybe if you're having a tough day at work and you're hating work at that phase in your life, maybe you don't talk about that to your kids. You know, I I don't have kids. So I'm I'm sorry if these are naive questions. No, these are wonderful questions. No, I mean, I try. You obviously need to be really age appropriate with certain things, right? Because little kids get scared or worried. No, we we try to, we have our values up on the wall. We have our family rules up on the wall. And hard work is a really big value in our household, which hard work is everything. So, you know, some days I, I will be very honest. Mommy's having a rough day. This is, you know, there's a lot going on and mommy's got some really tricky puzzles to solve and I'm trying to figure them out and they're not easy. So it doesn't all have to be rosy. I actually think being real with kids is important. Um, but you also want to make sure that you the fear, they don't need to have fear around things that are not necessary. But no, I love it. And and it, it's funny. It's like you can let them have the skill set. And one thing I will say that my dad did a great job of was um, I had a job. I had a summer job, by the way. Uh, I look back. I'm so grateful to my parents. I think they did it out of necessity. They had like no place for me to go. So I worked in their office. Um, my dad uh, was a pediatrician uh, taking care of kids. And I worked in his office. And I literally had to work. I filed everything. And um, he then would, when I got my paycheck, would put it in my saving investing account and show me how it was growing. And I just remember really understanding how investing worked as a result. And I think 
it like left such an impression on me to be like, okay, this is my money and I'm working hard and it goes here. Now it's growing. And I was like, I want it to grow more. And he was like, you have to put more in. And I was like, got it. So let's save this and not do this. And let's, and, and it felt so empowering to me as a child. And so I, I look back, that was probably one of the biggest imprints I had around my relationship with money was you can work hard and you can save it and it will grow. And so I was like, great, let's do more of that. And it has made me, knock on wood, a great investor as a result, which is I really understand the levers of not giving in to like my, you know, today's wants so that I can have far bigger things in the future. And that is at its core what uh, that 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 constraints and that self-restraint is a very important thing around money. At what age did you or will you start talking to your kids about investing? And then how do you bring up that conversation? How do you talk about now. it? Because obviously you don't say, oh, compounding interest and all of these terms that I it's kids funny. don't understand. It's funny. I um uh so uh I, I literally I uh, am with with a dear friend of mine. Um and I'm the Girl Scout troop leader with another friend uh for the second grade. And we made them write a business plan. We taught them compounding interest. And we help them really understand long-term decisions around investing. No, I talk about it my kids now, four, five, and eight right now. It's just part of the lexicon. It's part of uh, the everyday equation. And I think it's because it's so matter of fact, and we'll see how they turn out, right? <laughs> um, that's only the future will tell. Um, but at the bare minimum, they will have the skill sets. I know there are a lot of parents out there listening and saying, oh, yeah, I definitely want to teach my kids about investing. But maybe they themselves have not learned about it yet. So how would you approach those scripts with kids? What do you actually say to the kids to teach them about investing? Personal finance is not even more complicated than second grade math. Truly, it's that simple. It's just you have to understand the basic rules around it, which again kind of goes back to those those six steps that I discussed. So I think with little kids, find a little, go, go online, find a little basics of uh, personal finance video. We made a bunch, so uh, you can go Google those. But just literally, it's that simple. It's just starting to talk about it and help people. Under There's only two ways to change money. Make more or spend less. It's really simple. Make more, spend less. So really understanding that equation for little kids is actually pretty simple. Is there anything you're doing behind the scenes as a parent, like a 529 plan or a custodial Roth IRA to set your kids up financially? All of it. So 529 plans. But then the second that they really get their first paycheck, they can put it into a Roth IRA. And so, you know, my my kids are a little too young to have jobs. But the second that they can, that's exactly what we'll do. That's what my dad did for me. Um, and it very much like was eye opening to being like, wow, I'm starting to invest, you know, and I'm 10, 11, 12 um, when I really had my first summer jobs. So first, let me explain what a Roth IRA is. Let's just keep it simple. And I, I will say, if ever this sounds jargony, it's there's no such thing as a dumb question. And the truth is, it is so simple. So I'm going to break it down into super simple language. A Roth IRA, it's just an investment account. That's it. And IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. It's just an investment account. When you put the word Roth in front of it, all it means, which again, I, I wish I could rebrand all of personal finance for people. All it means is that the money you put in it, you've already paid your taxes on it. So let's just say you make $1,000 a month to go back to it. When the government, when that hits your, your bank account, you paid taxes. So the money has already come out, okay? Then you put it in your Roth IRA. You've already paid taxes. So now it gets to grow. And let's say you put $1,000 in. Let's say in 30 years, it's $30,000. In a Roth IRA, when you take money out, you don't pay taxes on it. It's your money, all every dollar you see. In a traditional IRA, when you put money in, you haven't paid taxes on it. When you go to take money out, you have to pay taxes then. So Roth IRA is my favorite. And if you have a Roth offered at work, a Roth 401k is also a thing. Same thing. All a 401k is, is an investment account. That's it. They should just call it an investment account. Um, but you, everybody listening, are allowed to have both. You can have a Roth IRA where you can invest about $6,000. I'm just keeping the numbers simple. And you can have a 401k where you can invest about $20,000. And you can do both. So hypothetically, you can invest for retirement $26,000 a year. It's a lot of money. Most people can't afford to do it. But you are allowed to. And that is what you want to take advantage of. 
And I think a lot of people don't realize for the Roth IRA, you were mentioning earlier that you can start it for your kids as soon as they have earned income. Correct. Can you talk about that one? Yeah, it's like an incredible gift to give your kids and I will absolutely do it for my kids. But when they are have their first earned income, you are allowed to take their paycheck and put it in a Roth IRA and let it start growing massively because the biggest trick compounding interest is not magic, it is math. And the most important variable is how long you let your money be invested and how long it can grow. And so if you have a 12-year-old or 13-year-old who has their first summer job and you take that money and you put it in a Roth 401k or Roth, sorry, Roth IRA, I mean, and they're not going to retire till 75, you just gave them 60 years of compounding interest. That is a huge gift. The last thing about a Roth uh, IRA, which is a, makes it a very big gift, is that you can actually access your money for an emergency with no penalty, mm -hmm. which is huge. So if you really have a crisis, you can take money out with no penalty. And I think also a great realization, I know a lot of people are listening and this is sparking in their head right now, is it doesn't have to mean that first job at 18, that's a traditional corporate job, right? It can be that babysitting gig that your child is having or dog sitting or whatever totally. they're doing at 12, 13, 14. Totally, literally. So you can take that money and put it in that Roth IRA and let it grow. And I think the other thing is don't do it for your children and not let them see it. Mm. The whole point is to show them and let them watch you make good decisions. I know half of you out there don't have kids, but the, for, for the half that do, kids model us. They model our behavior. So the other thing you can do, and if right now your head's in the sand and you're like, oh, money's so stressful, for your kids, you have to start learning. Let them see you have a book out on your table that says, I'm, re I'm learning about personal finance. Let them see you engage with it because they will model your behavior. If you ignore it at all costs, they will too. Mm. That's really, really important to say. I was also thinking another really good thing I can imagine doing for your kids is showing them the ups and downs of the market. Because I think when you start learning how to invest in your 20s, 30s, 40s, one of the scariest things is seeing that you've put $1,000 into the market, but then suddenly it goes down 20%. But I, I think that normalizing that the market does go up and down, but ultimately the long run over 10, 15, 20 years that you're investing, it traditionally goes up eight, 10% per year. I think that's a really important concept because then when they invest their money for the first time and it does happen to, let's say, go down 5%, they realize it's not a big deal because I'm invested for the long term, right? Yes, that's right. And I think the takeaway is set it and forget it. That's the word. Set it and forget it. So I feel confident that we've covered Roth IRAs. What about the 529 plans? So a 529 plan, all it is is a college account for your children. And saving for college for your kids, the sooner you do it. Like, um, I'm one of these people who I, you know, when our children were born to, you know, of course, like grandparents gave them like some clothes, but I actually said, just put some money in their 529 plans. Like that's actually, don't give me more stuff. I don't need more stuff. Don't, don't give them more toys, right? Give them an education in the future. And so a 529 plan your family can also donate and, and contribute to it. So it all it is is a plan that you can begin to save when a child is born so that they can not take out debt for college. One of the things too, it's, it's not just family that can contribute. I remember my friend had a baby. Instead of giving a baby gift, I just contributed to the baby's 529 plan. It truly is. And it's funny. It's one of these things that like I as a mom appreciate so much. One, we're all trying to take better care of the planet we care about all of the garbage we all create. And there's nothing better than a kid's education. And so as a parent, if somebody contributes to a 529 plan, I'm so grateful. I did a video recently where just to show the 529 plan in reality, it's a scenario with two couples and one's saving $50 a month. One is saving $50 a month, but putting that $50 a month into the 529 plan. And after 18 years, the one that just saved $50 a month that was about $10,000 in their savings account for college. The one that put it into the 529 plan and invested in an S&P 500 index fund, assuming 10% or 8% growth year over year, that was $20,000 at the end of that 18-year period. Compounding interest is wonderful. And that's exactly, that's ex what everybody out there should be doing uh, for their ch children. And you want to always start with your first child 
and you do as much as possible because if your first child doesn't use it all, you can also roll it over to your second child so that it gets fully used. Mm. So they always say overfund your first child. That's another hot tip. I love that. Anything else that people listening should be doing for their children or that you're doing for your child, children? I think the other really important thing outside of making money real, having them get a job, having them understand, you know, even if it's chores in the house that they're contributing and you give them X amount for for doing it, you know, a dollar a week, two dollars. It should not be elaborate, by the way. It should be simple, few dollars here and there, but making it very real for them. And I think as parents, saying no to your child is a really good thing to do also. No, we can't get that. It's expensive. We're going to save for it and you're going to be able to get it in the future. And I think it helps them learn the concept of, so there's this thing called the marshmallow trick where you could take little kids and say, would you like to have a marshmallow? Or if you wait till tomorrow, you can have two marshmallows. That is delayed gratification is the goal with money. All of us have to learn. And so I always say, Instead of calling it retirement savings, I think they should have called it retirement spending because all you're doing is giving yourself the ability to have a fabulous retirement. So it feels like you're depriving yourself, but that's the wrong way to think about it. You're actually just giving yourself more in the future. And so delayed gratification is the most important concept for kids to really understand. And for adults too. I I know we all need it, right? (laughs) We all need it. We all need it. I have a simple rule that people... When I tell people, they're like, oh, that's incredible. But it's really fundamentally simple. It's the seven day rule. It's if you want to buy something, instead of buying at that moment and clicking yes on the Amazon button, you wait seven days. And if after seven days you still want to buy it, then go ahead, guilt free, buy it. But if after that seven days you've forgotten what you even wanted to buy, that indicates to you that that would have been an impulse purchase that you shouldn't have purchased anyways. A hundred percent. Whenever I'm shopping in a store, I always take one thing out of my cart uh, as I'm checking out. Because you just realize there's all like truly you're like, eh, I don't need this last thing because you always end up throwing something in that you really don't need. And I and same thing, if there's a big purchase, I always have two or three things each year that I'm sort of eyeing. And to your point, it can be guilt free. But I, I, I'm i really thoughtful about what do I what do I want? What are we going to get? And sometimes I will literally say, you know what? It's not worth it. And I'm a big fan of experiences, too. Right. I, I'd rather do more adventures and experiences than stuff uh, because life's short. And so um, that's another kind of way I like to think about money. And for the kids too, right? The experiences are going to be much more impactful than the Barbie dolls or whatever you buy them. Totally. On the shopping thing, I was looking at shopping cart images from 10, 20, 30 years ago. You can guess what's happened over the last 30, 40 years. The shopping carts get bigger And it's just this illusion that stores create to give you, make you spend more money because the bigger it is, when you just put a few items in, it seems like you really haven't bought that much. Totally. So my ultimate thing when I'm really trying to save money, I don't use the shopping cart. I don't use the grocery basket. All I do is put it in my hands and whatever I can fit in my hands, even though sometimes I look ridiculous at Target or Whole Foods like looking like this, that's what I buy. And that just makes you hyper aware of exactly what you're putting into your hands. Totally, totally. Also Target, like you can't walk out of Target without spending a lot of money. And so I think you're it's just being really, really thoughtful um, yeah. is the key. One thing I noticed you, you kept repeating about your kids is that they earn money. It's not like you give them a set allowance amount for no reason every single week. Totally. I, um, I was laughing because it's like life doesn't give us allowance, right? Like we we earn the dollars we get, right? So in our household, it will absolutely the same will apply where, you know, and, and again, it's like it's got to be age appropriate. But, you know, when my almost eight year old, if let's say I have to go to a work phone call and I'll say, hey, can you watch? You know, she's actually incredibly responsible. I'll say, hey, you know, while while mommy steps into the room right here, can you keep an eye on the kids and I'll pay you a dollar for doing so? So Slash my daughter now has started to make her bed, which um, I made my bed every morning. And so she she's doing the same, but starting to earn. So it's like you can't pay your child to brush their teeth like that. That, that is a that is a must have. Right. <laughs> um, it's got to be things where it's above and beyond. So helping clean up, doing the dishes, those sort of things where it's like, in, I mean, I can't totally trust my kids who dishes yet. They would break things. But learning what they can do and letting them earn. And it's just creating that muscle and then helping them spend it. So it, it's been so cute. My, my daughter got a wallet when she was, I think, four. Hot pink wallet, loved it, had money in it. And 
it was so cute. One Christmas, she was like, mommy, I'd like to use my money and go buy everybody presents. This is when she was six. I think she had like $30 in there. You know, her grandpa had given her $5 because she won a game and things like that. And it just, she was spending her own money and she felt so proud of it. And I just remember being like, this is such a good lesson to teach kids to let them actually spend. And then to see her be so generous. I want to buy all my, you know, our family present. And so Again, it's not allowance because nowhere in life does free money just show up for people. So in our house, you have to earn it. And then it's really about helping her understand how and when to, to spend it. The, the last thing that I'll do is there are many piggy banks on my kids' shelves. So as you would imagine, everybody gave me piggy banks when my kids were born. I love them. And we have very different sizes. And so my mom made this massive one. It's adorable. My mom hand painted it. And that's college. It's huge and my daughter, like truly, we find pennies, we find quarters. Um, it goes in the college. And then there's many smaller ones. And then there's a tiny one, which is like for a toy you want to go get, a cupcake that you want to buy, the ice cream you want to get. And I think for her to see the visual representation of the biggest ones are where we need to save the most money. And it's simple, um, but we I take them really seriously. And uh, they're on the bookshelf in each of their rooms. They have these piggy banks. They understand it because we live in a world where money is very digital and they need to learn the physical before they learn the digital. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we do it in our household. And again, you have to earn money uh, because life doesn't just give you allowance um, in real life. Uh, and I think it's a, it, it's a really good practical way and they have fun doing it. That's the other thing. It's really genuinely fun. It's so funny listening to you talk about how you're teaching your kids. It's like, some of these things, though, apply to me as an adult. I really need to be thinking more consciously. About, <laughs> Listen, about we can we can all get better about money. All of us. It is really a work in progress. That's the thing about money. It's just like health, right? You're always a work in progress, right? You have days where you fell off the wagon and spent too much money, or uh, you know, weren't healthy and ate the French fries, and um, and then the next day you can be better. And it, it just remember you've got to be self loving through the process. Your kids are very young, but are you already seeing that difference between who cares about money and who doesn't? The little ones are too little uh, still to like really understand. But I know my daughter is quite the entrepreneur. Um, her little bracelet company, you know, it was amazing. She she like takes it really seriously and makes them and we ship them out and she gets the Venmo. And um, it's amazing because she like has so much fun doing it. So and she likes to make things. And so we'll see. I have no idea what she'll be as she grows up. But I can tell you now she likes she likes to build things. Uh, and, you know, I love to build things. I love to build companies. Is she understanding things like profit and a hundred percent? That's literally the book where we were like, this is, you know, the cost of the beads and here's how much you're selling them. So for a whole box of beads, if we sell four bracelets, everything above that is profit and she gets it. What would be your one personal finance takeaway for everyone listening today? So first, I hope everyone out there listening appreciates my my methodology, which is I want you to approach personal finance as a work in progress. I want you to give yourself grace. I think we all need to give ourselves more grace in life. None of us are perfect. And every single day you can change your life. Every single day. And so rip the bandaid off about feeling ashamed of the mistakes you've made. We have literally all made mistakes. I have made a zillion mistakes. Truly, that is not just talk. And um, I want you to decide that like now's the time that you're going to get good at your, your wallet. And, and the reason for that is it really empowers you everywhere. If you feel like you can stand up on your own two feet financially, your entire life changes. Truly, you stand differently, you walk differently. And it doesn't mean be rich. It means be in control of your money. That feels really fabulous. And so I want everyone out there listening to feel that way. I love that. And we have a little closing tradition. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Alexa Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away being able to say, Alexa taught me this? I would love for people to walk away saying, Alexa taught me how to fully change my relationship with money, not just for me, but for the generation that, that you know, is coming after you, your children. And remember that kids model what we do. So if you don't have a great relationship with money, your kids will not either. You need to have an empowered, strong relationship with money so that your children can. So if you're not going to do it for yourself, absolutely do it because your children will watch how you manage money. And I was really fortunate. My mom and dad both managed money well and were good at it. My mom was really thoughtful. And I picked up all of those traits. And it was very matter of fact in my household. Um, still, 
financial literacy is a question. It's not taught anywhere, which is, again, why you actually have to learn about it. So, yeah, learn about it. Uh, pick up the book uh, and feel that hopefully um, I gave you the grace to feel empowered around your wallet. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. You're a blast. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.